sorry about that. My screensaver came on and stopped the recording. So, yeah, that took a bit too long. So, yeah, Corpse Voyage. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yeah, Mahamatra fits also. And Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Miko's theme also contains it. Anyway, that was fun. Okay, so what are you seeing? Rod asked. There's one, two, seven different layers, Mukara counted with her eyes wide, wide open behind her specs. Seven? I thought three was the max. Me too. She was, Mukara whispered as she decoded sequences, scenarios, and many other processes required to keep such a vast realm running smooth. She was so close to obtaining answers. She just needed to know where this illusory Tokyo was stored. So, did you find him? Anything about Kripa? Rada asked after some time. No. Half the information is blocked off or coded. And no clues as to where the illusory Tokyo could be? Rada flattened her ears on her head. I do. It's right under this layer. Mokara pointed the ground with a mechanical finger. And Rada followed it with keen eyes. Problem is, the time between here and the layer under us is disjointed. Rada groaned as she threw her head back in sheer exasperation. Think like, you know, Thurston the cat? You know that? Ah! Yeah, that, that's what she did right there. Jet lag was a bitch in hate to deal with. To deal was a bitch in heat to deal with. To deal with. Oh my God, my French accent is terrible. And that's not all. The only way in is heavily guarded, so we can't forget trying to sneak in. And how about using some of your Taoist art? You know, like slipping through a crack. Mukara shook her head. This would warn the master or mistress of the place that they have an unwanted visitor. And what if we just went and gunned the blazing? The cat suggested as she summoned one of her many evil spirits. Mukara paused, considering this option. It would do wonder to her stress level, especially with how frustrated she was with the whole ordeal. But at the same time, she didn't have the time to gather her usual shock team. And yes, in Mukara shock team, shock team there's um, Yamuna. And there's, um, you know, the one with the back doors, Okinamatara. Um, yeah, okay, so a bit of a detail. Uh, well, there's also other one, not Reimu, or, well, Marisa got married and is with kids right now, and she lives in Africa. Um... It's Sanae, mostly Sanae and Yomu. Um, also Sakuya, but once again, Sakuya is very busy trying to ta- trying to maintain a semblance of peace in Pakistan because you know, um, her and Romelia were actually going to India the first time, and Romelia wanted to go on a plane very very badly, and um, same with Flandre. Because she was curious. Plane ride went well. They passed the custom without much trouble. You know, they did everything like we do, but won the place to India. Well, the Pakistan India war got worse, and the plane got stranded, and Re- uh, Remedia got. Um, she got angry. She got mad, and she basically took over Pakistan. No, she didn't take over India. She decided to take over Pakistan. The economy is great. They now have a healthcare system. Um, Famine is practically unheard of. There is almost no homeless people. And yeah. So she made it illegal for the um, 
for Muslims to attack the Hare Krishna and she made so that the Hare Krishnas who are living there, yes, they are Hare Krishnas in, pa in Pakistan. I actually know one woman who's an actual refugee because of that in, in, uh, in my temple. Um, well, it's not really my temple, it's Radha Manohar temple. And uh, right now she is waiting for her, the rest of her family. So because that, you know, just something I wish to happen would be for those border war to end because Pakistan is a part of India. Um, it's just people who are, sorry, I just want to keep this open. It's just souls who think that they are, Hin that, you know, that there's Hindus versus Muslim you know, because they they think themselves this body and they're attached to their land, they're attached to it, to something that really doesn't... Basically, if you die in Pakistan and you hate a Hindu, you will take birth in a Hindu family and you will hate the Pakistani. And because of that, when you die as a Hindu, you will take birth as a Muslim Pakistani in Pakistan and so on and so forth ad infinitum. Literally, or, well, not, no, yeah, really, ad infinitum. So that's basically the samsara. You die hating something, you will be born as what you hate. You die by thinking about something you love, and you will take birth as something you love. If you love the ocean, you'll take birth as a fish. If you think, if you love volcanoes, you'll take birth as a creature living inside volcanoes. Yes, there are creatures living inside volcanoes. We don't see them, but they do exist. Um, if, you're Can if you're Russian and you hate Americans, you will take birth as an American who hates the Russian. And basically, this is samsara. This is reincarnation. And I'm trying to break you out of that, guys. Because... You deserve better. You deserve so much better. You deserve your, your eternal life. So, yeah. Uh, Mukara Shock Team. Actually, I just made it up on, on the spot, so. But the thing about the Raymelia having taken over Pakistan, it's out of love, guys. She's not that bad. There are worse vampires out there. <laughs> um, and yet, okay, let's go back. And yet, she knew Radha's power level. They could probably be able to conquer the damn place. But I'm not here to conquer. I'm here to recover my son's body. And she could not blow up the place on her way out. No, I will deal with this sin in later. As cathartic as it would be, she knew her priority. Radha pouted. Oh, poo. So how are we supposed to get in then? Called Yamuna and bully her into opening a gap for us? She crossed her arms, still on edge by the power that controlled the realm. Mokara was about to retort when what was unmistakably a low powered master spark blew a hole, raising her feet. Thankfully, after going through a, 20, a full 20 miles of bedrock, the beam was nowhere near as lethal. It merely sent some light sent some light shock in Mukara's silver nerves. Once the beam stopped, both Vaishnavi looked down at the newly bored hole. Wow! Thank Krishna! Radha prayed to the Lord. Mukara tried to process what this could mean. This was unmistakably a master spark. Only two people in existence had this ability. Yutika, the flower master and her estranged donor. Um, okay. So, well, Toyosa Tomi, Prince Toyosa Tomimi no Miko, um, you know, is technically a transgendered woman. And so, if you were to look inside of her, she does have something that looked like a womb. But, unfortunately, that's just all cosmetic, because... Uh, hormonally wise, she's still a man. So for her to be able to have children is not really possible. Um, but as she went to preach in um, in Gensokyo two years after becoming a Hare Krishna, um, she met, uh, well actually not she met Yusika, but uh, Yuka 
was searching high and low for her and as she was actually afraid she thought Yuka would kill her because as a Hare Krishna we offer flowers we pick flowers and we offer it to God and the Lord um, like if you were to see our Murtis you, you will notice that the Lord Radha Krishna Goranita Jagannath Badev Subhadra or they always have a garland they always have um, flowers in their hair. I know, right? Uh, this today, okay, today we're on the Ekadashi. Radharani wears a nice flower headdress. Um, it's all um, no, they're not well. Carnations, because they're the cheapest and they're one who lasts the longest. But we also like to use when we can have them. Um, oh, what's the name of those orange flowers that smell strong? Um. Anyway, we use plenty of flowers. So obviously, Mokara was, you know, she thought she thought Yuka would kill her. As it turns out, no. Um, Yuka, the reason why she was so protective about those flowers is not because those were spirit of the dead, you know, of the PC-68, 98? Yeah, PC-98 character who died when Shinki threw her to her temper tantrum. Um, no, actually, um, Yuka is, um, she's from the previous era. She's from Dwarpara Yuga. She is actually, um, she actually came at the very, very end of Dwarpara Yuga when the previous age turned into Kali Yuga. And she came here expecting to meet Krishna. Because in Twapara Yuga, Krishna descended and had his pastime. And this is actually real. This is not part of my story. Okay, real fact. God was on earth 5,000 years ago. Plus. Um, he came down as his original form as Shama Sundar. Krishna, so two-arm Krishna, not Vishnu. Well, he can also look like Vishnu, but he came as his original form as a, an adorably mischievous, loving, sweet, and all attractive cowherd boy. Yeah, God's a cowherd boy. And so Krishna's pastime, you know, are real. They are not fake. We still have traces of Krishna being on earth in the area of Vrindavan in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, they are, we have stones which have his footprints. There's also another phone, another phone, another stone with his footprint, the print of his stick that he had put in the mud, well, on the stone, sorry, and the hoof of a cow. Um, we also have um, also some toys that used to belong to Shimati Radharani, and those are made out of emeralds and ivory. And we're talking, those are a huge chunk, because the bird, okay, there's, I saw a picture of this bird, you know, a, an emerald parrot, and it's as big as an actual parrot. And it's all emerald, guys. Anyway, you can believe it, you can also not believe it. But it's true, it happened. So anyway, to tie Krishna's pastime to there, while well, Yuka wanted to go come to, to Krishna's pastime, she's actually from the moon. No, 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 she's not a Lunarian. She's come from Chandraloka, which, okay, the actual moon? Okay, big controversy, nobody wanted the moon, guys. Because it's just way too far, it's the heavenly planet. And on the moon, it's not just a rock with dust and nothing else. It's actually where all the plants come from. Because plants and fruits get their rust, their juice, their taste, their, you know, their cooling effect on the body. It comes from the moon. It's come from moonlight. So can you imagine how filled with forest the moon is? <laughs> so anyway... Yuka come there. She came down expecting to go into Krishna's Rasalila, but it took her a bit too long to come down. And when she arrived, Vrindavan was a desert. Because when Krishna left the planet, and this is actually a fact, um, 
Sri Krishna brought all of his associates back to back with him, back to Goloka. You know, there are actually two Vrindavan, which is actually one. There's the Goloka Vrindavan, which is in a spiritual sky, which has nothing to do with this place, with the material world. And then Krishna has his pastime there eternally. There's no birth, there's no death. Um, and Krishna's pastime goes on eternally. And then there's Bhoma, uh, there's Bhoma Vrindavan or Gokula Vrindavan, which is on earth in Uttar Pradesh. Um, it is, I believe, a few hours from Delhi. Um, and right now, well, the forest, the 12 forests of Vrindavan, um, Govardhan Hill, all those things are getting hidden. Uh, like most of the forest right now, I had heard someone who went there. She told me it's a desert. And if you were to look, you know, in summer and in winter, well, there's not much. All the flowers are sleeping. Um, you know, it's still rural except in, Vrinda except in Vrindavan town because, you know, with all the tourists that, you know, all the spiritual, all the pilgrims that came here, mostly Americans, they're like, hey, hey let's make money. And it's all right, you know, if you take birth, that means you did something right. So don't, if if, the, if some people who hear this are from Vrindavan, please don't waste your life. Please don't go to, to the U.S. Just go to anyone at the temple and worship Krishna. Worship Radha Krishna. So, yeah. Um, before, 5,000 years before, prior, Vrindavan was overflowing with trees, flowers, and there are those who took birth there, um, there are Krishna's associates, and they're also practicing devotees. Like, there's a group of gopis who, in their previous birth, were great sages that were in the Dandak forest in Lord Ram pastime, and they worshipped the Lord in the mood, you know, seeing the Lord as a lover. And so when they saw Lord Ram, they recognized him as, hey, that's our Gopal. That's, that's our Krishna. But Lord Ram says, you know, I know your heart and I know your desire. The thing is, I cannot give it to you. Because I, I only have one wife. I am Eka Patni. And, but, you know, just wait in your next birth. You'll take birth as gopis. And then you'll attain what you want. Now, it's having the Lord as a lover is not such a cheap, cheap thing as wearing clothes and dressing as a woman. It's actually, it takes for you to give up all sense gratification and all hope that in this world can give you pleasure. You have to be willing to die at a thousand times at every single breath you take for Krishna. No, it's not, it may look fun, but before you can reach there, it's practically impossible. So, so they are practicing sadakas. They are um, the daughters of the demigods and they are Krishna's eternal associates. So all those people, you know, at the end of Krishna's pastime, um, we're talking near to the time where he enacted his disappearance pastime. Oh, by the way, no, Krishna did not die at Prabhas. He did the very first substitute. Yes, Krishna, you substitute. It's super effective because all atheists thought he died when, nope, he just left a copy of his body at Prabhas, etc. And then he just flew up Back home, back to uh, Vaikuntha, because that was actually Vishnu. Is that complicated yet? <laughs> that's that's in our holy scripture. That's in the Srimad Bhagavatam. If you want to have people explain to you better, I would please invite you to go and look at Iskon Desire Tree. Everything is there. Anyway, back to it. So, okay, yeah, main topic. Um... Yuka tried to reach Krishna, but she got a, she was too late and she arrived in the desert instead of beautiful forest filled Vrindavan. So she cried and cried and then Purnamasi, um, she's actually Krishna's illusory potency. She's the one who controls 
Well, she's one of the main power of Krishna. Not the main, just, you know, a main. And she told her that please don't cry. The Lord will come back again um, in Kali Yuga. So what I want you to do is prepare a garden of flowers for him. And protect those flowers with your life. And when he comes, offer him all of his flowers. So, um, after this, like 500 years from now, uh, Lord Chaitanya appeared, but Yuka, you know, he, Lord Chaitanya was on the planet for um, 48 years, but this time, what prevented Yuka from uh, meeting with Lord Chaitanya was, well, she couldn't cross the ocean. Because she offended a great sage who wanted to pick a flower and to offer to the Lord. Because her flowers were the best. But she misunderstood and she almost killed him. But the great sage cursed her that she couldn't see the Lord. That it would be impossible for her to see the Lord until the Lord come to Gensokyo. So... Once again, she beat herself up and she said, you know, what can I do? But, but then she realized that the Lord will come, must come to Gensokyo. So she maintained her beautiful, for, uh, her beautiful garden. She kept planting it, improving it, expanding it. And which is why she was so aggressive about it, especially with the fairies. At first, she tried to be nice about it. But the fairies were so dumb that they took it as a fun challenge and eventually Yuka got mad and began just killing them outright. Now, when she heard Mukara was there, at first she was, you know, because Miko actually managed to get out of, of Gensukyo, not out of a gap, but through the Sunzu. Well, once again, Miko couldn't have kids. Uh, that was the main reason why she changed gender. Um, so with this failed and not finding any other thing which gave her pleasure in the life anymore, she decided that, you know what, immort if this is going to be immortality, let me just end it right now. So she went to the Sanzu, left her shoes behind, and of course her decision by the Sanzu was uh, made stronger when she saw all the unborn and, um, you know, stillborn ghosts. So this broke her heart, and while well, first she said, you know, you can take birth from me, they all look and says, well, you can't, you can't have children. So this broke her heart, and you know, in Japan, there's a big taboo about adoption. Adoption in Japan is near impossible, which is why there are not more Chi Japanese people adopting the Chinese which would, you know, be less of a hassle than, you know, American, European, Russian, and others trying to adopt Chinese. Anyway, um, so, yeah, Miko jumped into the Sanzu expecting to, sit, to stop being to exist. But no, actually the Sanzu is one of the tributary of Yamuna. So... Also, the Yamuna is also described as a dark river, just like the Sanzu. It's just that there, because it's not Vrindavan, Yamuna doesn't sing. So Yamuna brought... Yeah, because the river Yamuna is a person. She's actually a goddess. So Yamuna brought Miko to Ganga, who's also a person. And Mother Ganga brought Miko to her bank. And there she was found by, yes, a self-insert, basically me. Um, but better than what I am right now. And her name is Mandodhari, or the soft-bellied one. Yes, I'm chunk. I'm quite chunk. So if I do a self-insert, she'll be chunk also, because I don't want to see myself as anything better. So Mandodhari uh, thought Mukara, she brought her to her guru. Uh, one and a half year later, Miko, well, Satomimi no Miko, gave up this name for good and completely uh, conquered death by becoming Mokara Devidasi. 
And then she was sent back to Vrindavan, uh, to Vrindavan to get Sokyo, carrying with her a pair of Murti. Now, those Murtis, uh, those deities, they're not idols, they're not just statues, it's actually God. Yeah, I know, a bit more esoteric, but eh, what can I do? That's the fact. And um, she brought them, and the reason why Yuka was running for her and looking for her, that's because she had desperately needed to offer those flowers to Goranitai. So eventually, also yes, Miko really did need those glasses. Once again, she was born a thousand years before when glasses were not a thing. So um, when she went to you know, Mayapur, we actually have eye doctor and, you know, her friend and her adopted family, some Russians, um, noticed that she would look at those sacred book from very, very, you know, practically her nose on the book. And he asked, you know, is it okay? Are you okay, Miko? You seem to have trouble reading. And she said, well, no, I, you, you have trouble reading? Um, I mean, don't your eyes kind of get bad? Or, you know, you know, it's... She just asked, no, I mean, I mean, you must have better eyes than I do. Like, well, yes. Yeah. So they brought her to an ophthalmologist. And as it turns out, yes, she really did need those glasses. <laughs> so my Miko wears glasses. And, um, okay, something happened to her that her arms and legs got cut off. Uh, but she made friend with some people. And now she has arms, she has limbs again. But when she wasn't still recovering from her ordeal, Yuka found her. Uh, Miko screamed, or Mukara screamed, until she saw Yuka paying full obeisances to Goranitai and showering them with fresh flower from a garden that she herself had picked. And she was so um, grateful to Mukara that she said, you know, if you want to have something, I have the power to give you whatever you desire. And Miko's like, okay, I will think about it. A few years later, she's like, okay, I know what you des what your dream is. Because, you know, Yuka's also a dream master. And she's like, well, I know you want to have a son. So, okay, I will give you a son. Come here. And then after some details, I know, but I will not tell you because it's highly technical and a bit gross. Um, Miko became pregnant. And ten months later... Nana, she was, Krishna Kripa was born. And one year and six months later, he was, well, kidnapped. And, well, he was first, um, somebody faked his death and he was kidnapped. And he managed to make his way to the hermitage and that's the pastime right now. So, yeah, that was like 30 minutes or something. Okay, this was unmistakably a master spark. Only two per people in existence had this ability. Yutika, the flower master and estranged donor. And Marisa, actually it's Maricha Devidasi, who was now living in Durban with her husband and two beautiful children. But there was a third person who also had this potential. No, no, it can't be. My Krishna's dead. Aki would never make such a mistake. And yet, hermitages were known to make the Yamadutas job harder, and it would confuse their filing system. It was another reason why those who were usually filled with ghosts. Mukara closed her eyes and prayed, O oh Krishna, O oh Master of Unlimited Universe, you have a plan. And I am but an instrument. Please, protect me from illusion and guide me. Use me for your purpose. Radha Shyama Sundar touched her shoulder. Hey, sis, we have to move. Some bad birds are giving, sorry, are giving Hitchcocks a run for his money. Indeed, many winged figures swarm the sky, being summoned by the anomaly. The two sky-bound Vaishnavi slid through the air like a pair of shadow. The way was open. They just needed to sneak in. 
back in Tokyo, in the Yashiro well, things were going well. The demons were not used to fighting someone with an elemental shovel. Nanashi was immune to the Apsaras and Mermaid's allurement, and most of what was chaos aligned were more than happy to let him go. Since who could be stronger than someone who killed Lucifer's finest with nothing but a shovel and God's grace? His sister was not concerned about all the water, and Nanashi's sight was unimpeded by the darkness. Better yet, since Krishna's shirt had been destroyed, numerous poets would be at loss of word in front of the beauty that a thoroughly soaked Krishna generated. The Lord had foregone most of his jewelry, leaving an um, unobstructed vision of his magnificent form. And yes, I will use the word magnificent for Krishna, because um, do yourself a favor. Go look at Krishna during summer. He doesn't wear a shirt. And sometimes his dhotis are hiked up to his knee. No, no, no. Guys, I cannot even begin to explain. It's impossible to explain how beautiful Krishna is. There, that's why we cannot give description of God. We can try. But first of all, he's so bright, we cannot see him with, his, with our eyes. And he's also spiritual, so unless he wants to, we cannot see him. And third, he's just so unlimitedly, expandingly beautiful that you cannot grasp his form. You cannot grasp Krishna. Your brain, your material brain, just cannot compute how beautiful he is. And it's basically melting down. It's not because God is something unknowable and something that doesn't make sense. He has two arms, two legs, a chest, a face, hands, eyes, a mouth. One mouth, two eyes, one nose, two ears, ten fingers, ten toes, which are like lotus petals, so delicate and long. He's made out of spiritual nature, which is ever expanding. So you blink your eyes, he's more beautiful. You breathe, he's more beautiful. You look at him, he's more beautiful, and you cannot grasp that. Your brain cannot grasp God's beauty, which is why he appears as... Archavigraha, or as temple deities. And as a temple deity, he, you know, he follows the rule of matter, meaning he looks the same, but to those whose eyes are anointed with a paste of love, you who have been practicing Krishna consciousness and who has received the grace of Goranga Mahaprabhu, this, that's not stone you're seeing, that's him. And he's moving. They are moving on the altar. They're not stone. They're not wood. They're not painting. It's him. It's not a book. It's, the Gita is not a book. The Gita is Krishna. Anyway. Um, yeah. <laughs> Krishna's beauty. Quite a topic. I, Ananta Sheshanag. The real Ananta Sheshanag. He chant Krishna's glories. One head ch always chants something different, and he's been chanting then for all eternity. And he never sang the same thing twice, and no head sang the same thing as the other one. That kind of tell you how unlimited he is. We don't know anything about Krishna. What I say, that's not even an atom of Krishna. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um... Nanashi, Nanashi could even perceive his dark blue ties to the drenched yellow silk fabric that clung to his perfect legs. Okay, Krishna's knees are described to be a treasure box of beauty. That's just Krishna's knees, and Krishna's feet are, are said to give liberation. It says that, okay, the gopis hold Krishna's feet to their, he to their chest. Um... And this is why, you know, this is where Krishna's feet are. And those gopis are the most powerful being in the entire universe because they control God by their love. And that's because they keep meditating on Krishna's feet. So if it's just that medit, well, feet and more. But, you know, Krishna's lotus feet. Oh, yeah, um... It's not being a footsie, it's being a Vaishnavi. It's being, you know, Vaishnav culture means you love feet. <laughs> it's, 
It may sound ridiculous, but eh, you know, spitting out the straight fact here. Okay, back on the topic. Woo, Krishna, that was great. Okay, and yet, Nanashi could not shake away the dread he felt. The further they went in, the heavier the sense of hopelessness became. It was almost like a physical entity lurking under their feet, a sleeping calamity bidding its time until it could strike. And he seemed to be the only one aware of the sleeping beast. His sister was utterly unaware of what lurked under their feet. What the hell was she tasked to rouse? Kripa, you look pale. Krishna commented from the stone he had been sitting on, playing his flute while Krishna and his sister took a well-deserved pause. No shit, Krishna. I have no idea what is this, what's in this stupid seal, but I know it's bad news. Krishna addressed his lord in his heart, discreetly moving closer to him. He just felt safer like this, under the lord's lotus feet. Krishna's natural effulgence was soothing, nurturing, and oh so loving. As Nanashi performed his new favorite activity, massaging Krishna's soft, delicate, fragrant, cooling, and oh-so-sweet, fragile feet, he tried to change the Lord mind about the entire matter, hoping his service would put him in a better mood. Krishna, I think we should turn back. Let Azahi spread my darkest secret to all. It's not just, it's just not worth it. No, better we awaken the sleeping beast. Okay, so here. I know, it's... <sighs> you know me, I like to put my comments on everything. So, usually, when you serve Krishna, Krishna's heart melts for you. And thus, he will arrange something else. But this time, Krishna has another plan. Because Nanashi is not on the level of being able to request things to Krishna. Um, and Krishna, even if a pure devotee asks something to Krishna, like... Um, recently, we had a saint leave his body, going back on back to Godhead. Um, I don't know if you heard of him. His name was His Holiness Bhakti Charu Swami. And he got the COVID-19 virus. And he unfortunately did not survive. Um, so they actually, the, um, the Prime Minister, with the help of the Prime Minister of India, they brought his body back. It's not that we didn't pray to Krishna. The entire movement prayed for his be the betterment of his health. And yes, Krishna can and will perform miracles. Miracles are true. I mean, if you look for a PDF of the miracle of Lord Narasimhadev, you know, Mayapo Narasimhadev, you have a girl who was basically, she had an accident. She fell from... Um, the playhouse in Mayapur's Grihasta area, she fell on the top of her head and the bottom of her skull cracked. And, you know, she was vomiting. There was, um, spinal fluid was flowing out of her nose. Her sclera was red and she was dying. They worshipped Lord Narasimhadev. And Lord Narasimhadev, okay, the moment they finished the puja, the little girl woke up. Yeah, because she was in a coma. She woke up, eyes are clear. No stop, no stop bleeding, you know, there's no nothing flowing out and, you know, there's no more brain damage. She's completely okay. And personally, this is something I know an actual person. Um, she's a Prabhupada disciple who also had a miracle of Lona Um, So her son-in-law had a cancer inside of the ear. So inside the ear means it's in the brain. Um, he was in London about to go under the knife, about to go to a very long procedure. His wife and mother-in-law um, are in Mayapur and you know, they're following the procedure via SMS. And this is a true story. I am telling you this is a hundred percent true. Um, you know, they're doing the puja, they bought the biggest offering plate to Nishimhadev. And she, um, you know, they're following it and then, you know, it, the procedure is about to start and then they receive an SMS that is basically procedures cancelled, surgeries cancelled. So they don't know what happened. Well, what happened is, on the operating temp uh, table, the tumor went away. And it was not just something inside the brain. It was a big, fat tumor uh, that, you know, it, they have medical record. 
they have the picture, the doctor, you know, the neurosurgeon practice on getting that thing out with the least amount of damage and it's gone. You know, he's on the operating table and the thing is gone. They check both ears. They check if it's the right patient. They check everything and it is gone. <laughs> and that's a true story. I didn't hear it from a friend of a friend of mine. I heard it from the mother-in-law of the man who got a tumor removed by God. <laughs> so it does happen. But that's because the Lord desired it. But the Lord always have a plan. And we don't know that plan. Like, Krishna, like Nana, she doesn't know the plan. So his plan was to bring Bhakti Charu Swami, which is a, who is a beloved devotee, you know, a pure devotee of the Lord. He's like the ideal devotee. But Krishna's plan was for him to go to another place. Remember, we're not the body. The body's already dead. Death happen when the soul exits the body and is about to take another birth. So right now, we either Bhakti Charusami is back in his spiritual form, serving Krishna in Vrindavan or serving Goranga in Mayapur or serving both of them simultaneously and or serving Srila Prabhupada somewhere in the universe. But the plan was for him not to be here. So, yes, pure devotees. We're talking devotees who love God, who have who know who know who they are eternally. They can ask something to God. But if the Lord has another plan, then it's Krishna's plan that will take precedent. Like in the battle of Kurukshetra. In Kurukshetra, don't you think Arjuna didn't ask the Lord to prevent the war from happening? Of course, and the Lord went to play the messenger to Duryodhan, but the war still happened. Why? Because Krishna had to speak the Bhagavad Gita, and the best place to, be, to speak the Bhagavad Gita was in the middle of a fratidical battlefield of Kurukshetra. And on the Kurukshetra, well, so Krishna had to destroy um, plenty of demons. And those demons, okay, Krishna could go and seek them out individually, but Krishna kind of wanted to wrap up the killing demon part of his pastime and go back to Vrindavan. So what's easier than to have a big, big, fat war and have all the demons in one place? And because he wanted to give fame to his devotee, Krishna just played the role of a charioteer. A charioteer happened to be God because he wanted Arjun to ha Arjun and his four other brother to have fame. I mean, Krishna, when Krishna does something or don't doesn't do anything, that's because he has like fifty thousand unlimited different plans going on simultaneously as he wants them to. <laughs> so now Krishna has a plan for Krishna Kripa and whatever is under the well. And the plan will be successful. It may not look ideal for us, but God's plan are always perfect. The COVID-19 virus, I'm happy we have it. Why? Because then the outreach is more. We got to outreach more people via internet. We got to, I mean, Niranjana Swami published a book about the neck of the holy name. For us devotees, it gives us a chance to not go to work and just read Prabhupada's book, read the Srimad Bhagavatam, absorb ourselves into Krishna and meditation. So for us devotees, social distancing, yeah, it can be hard because we miss the temple. But this feeling of separation just shoots us forward, it rockets us forward toward perfection so quickly. So for materialists, yeah, okay, it's terrible. For spiritualists, Oh no, that's sectarian. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. That's just... Uh... <laughs> okay. So Krishna said, No, better we awaken the sleeping beast. Krishna placed a hand on Krishna's shoulder. But why? If we leave the cal this calamity alone, then other will come down to rouse it, and they will not have the ability to deal with one, with the one sleeping there. Ah, uh, Nanashi groaned. Kripa, 
It is simply not fair for this soul to be locked away in the dark, the Lord explained. To keep a problem locked away is just begging for it to return later. And to expect someone stronger to deal with a problem is irresponsible and one of the greatest show of cruelty that I know of. Krishna explained solemnly, his, eye mis his eyes misty. Yeah, I'm not. I kind of forgot about... Yeah, I'm basically doing it uh, cold. So, uh, yeah. You want him to be freed then? I do, Krishna confirmed. I cannot stand to see my jiva suffering. But you're still keeping us here, Nanashi mildly accused. Krishna turned his misty eyes to his servant. It does not mean that I like keeping you all keeping you all in this miserable world of matter. The Lord lowered his face. I will not impede on the desire and will of my parts and parcels, he explained. You all came to this mature world for enjoying without me, and thus I let you be. Nanashi openly stared at Krishna. From the pain in his voice, Nanashi wondered how God managed to remain sane with the amount of grief he felt. Once again, I felt to portray that. So basically, you all came to this mature world for enjoying without me. And thus, I let you be. It broke his newly regrown heart. Yeah, that was a better take. And what if we want to enjoy with you? Nanashi asked. If having fun without Krishna made him sad, the opposite must be true also. Krishna smiled as he looked at his servant with, a, with eyes heavy with love. Then you come back to me in a form suitable for the type of loving relationship you desire to share with me. So, I meant then. This is what you want, Krishna? Then as she asked his master, changing the subject. I do. The soul imprisoned there now deserves his freedom. And if it proved to be another pain in the ass, he gently pressed Krishna's lotus feet meaningfully. Hopefully, it will not get to that. Krishna spoke as he gracefully arose from the now melted rock, removing his ever sought after limb from Nanashi's now reddish hands. Thank you for the massage, my dear. Your hands are as pleasing as moonlight. Nanashi's heart began to flutter. No regrets there. And yes, he had asked Nanash Azahi's angels if she knew anything about who was under there. The angel, let's call her Mai, had regretfully informed Nanashi that she was not privy to such matter, only that the god who held that the god held captive within the Yashiro well was from beyond the mountain range in the west, and that his freedom would doom everyone would doom everything. Great! They had gathered the two emblems after some very disappointing fight with a pair of angels. The final stone had receded into the floor, granting them access to the inner sanctum of the walls, where the feeling of doom, hatred and hopelessness now took an almost physical form. As Ahi stared at the now open cave, rubbing her drenched arm as if from the cold. You feel it now, don't you? Nanashi You feel it now, don't you? Nanashi whispered from the shelters of Krishna, from the shelter of Krishna's presence. It's a strong demon. The young girl gave an uneasy grin. Thank goodness he's on Flynn's side. As a come on, Nanashi, let's go. She interrupted her brother as she grabbed his arm and pulled him further in the final cave. Nanashi could only crane his neck toward Krishna whose face has turned somber. This worried Nanashi to no end. Nanashi! Nanashi, wake up! It was Asahi. He got up from the wet, rocky ground of the cave. Asahi? Hari, what the hell happened? He asked his sister and his master. Krishna was looming behind Asahi, his gaze more than a little worried. He put a hand to his head, checking if Krishna's lotus was still tucked behind his ear. Indeed, the mystical flower hadn't budged, budged an inch. 
Azahi, who was kneeling on the ground, sighed with a very annoyed look to her. You fainted when we jump. We jump? He couldn't remember jumping. Azahi pointed up to the unseen ceiling. Yeah, we came up to, at the end of the path. You thought it was a dead end, but I knew better. She puffed her chest up. Fear doused Nanashi's back. He could feel Azahi's dead grip on his wrist, his legs locking up. The absolute brick shitting moment when he plummeted. Kripa? Kripa, it's all right. I'm here. He heard Krishna, his sweet, soothing tenor dispelling the fear he felt. Nanashi could feel his mighty arms around his aching shoulder and his broad chest as the best of shelter. He hated height. And he hated the absolute darkness that pervaded this god, gosh darn place. Not even his inhuman sight could pierce it. Only Krishna's dazzling effulgence dispelled the darkness. He got up from the ground with, on shaky legs with Krishna's help. If we survive this, I swear I will worship you forever. Isn't it what you're doing right now? Krishna deadpan with an amused smile. Finally, come on. Let's go. She grabbed his arm again, rushing at first toward the imminent danger. As the trio emerged from the final waterfall, Nanashi was on high alert, his right hand gripping his shovel and his heart racing. The room they were in was by definition cavernous. The height of the ceiling, the water rushing down on its wall and pulling at the floor, created a vertigo effect. In the middle loomed a massive storm orb about thrice the size of Nanashi. From under what could only be the ark, congealed shadow seeped out like an infectious disease. Nanashi really hoped Azahi was right and that whoever was there really was one on Flint's side. He took a deep breath. It was no use worrying. God was on his side. He also knew whatever was there probably would not be able to survive an attack of pure light, and who knows, maybe he was an ally of Flynn after all. God, Krishna knew the samurai of hope would need all the help he would get. Indeed, Krishna intoned, not entirely paying attention to his servant. He, he was gazing at the orb, his eyes cast in what seemed to be grief. Krishna... Is everything all right? Nanashi asked his lord. He hated when Krishna looked less than his usual happy self. What's under there? But before Krishna could give a, could give an answer, the sound of a small boat plying the rippling water came to Nanashi's ears. He stopped in his truck, his shovel at the ready. Nana, we have company. We have company. Oh, sorry, that was. Na na na, uh, that was Azahi. We have company. Nanashi informed his sister, moving in front of the Lord. Behind him, he heard Krishna's bubbling, love-filled chuckle. Suddenly, a small figure emerged from behind the moss-covered orb, a dwarf in a boat wearing goose skin. Halt! He threw his hand out, standing between the trio and their goal. I am Shukuna Hikona. Oh, sorry, there's... Uh, yeah, I, I'm really wondering what my spell check is thinking. I am Shukuna Hikona no Kami, guardian of the sealed ark. I'm Aegis, and as she responded in kind. This is my sister, Zahi, and the one standing behind me is Harry. <laughs> Shuku Sukuna Hikona, who was not expected to be greeted so cordially, took some time to recover. I only see a yokai and a jinka, the dwarf flatly informed the teen. The teen. Oh, so he couldn't see Krishna. The dwarf gazed at the two, at the two youth. So, uh, who is in there? And as she asked to dispel the very awkward and tense silence. The kami once again let his stone-like gaze linger on the teens, and then inclined his head. This shrine is where we... The ancient god of gods of these lands have sealed away the most dangerous foreign deity. Foreign deity? Hmm. Can we know his name? Nanashi prodded. 
No, for it would make the immoral one grow in strength, Shukuna Ikona informed. Now you tell me, why have you come to this accursed place? We've come to open the ark, Azahi gleefully informed as she struck a pose she must have seen in an anime. And this is where the shit hits the fin. And this is where the shit hits the fin. Nanashi dryly spoke in his heart, keeping a stoic face and choosing the sapphire, a stone of wind. Shukuna Heikona was small, wore a large feather cape, and was on a boat landing on still water. It did not take a genius to figure out how it would go. No, um, I, okay, the actual weakness of Shukuna Hikona is lightning, which I found very stupid for Nanashi to add, to, to cast in a place, you know, there are, um, they are knee to ankle deep in water. And yes, even if he's, if Nanashi is basically a plant, plants are also affected by lightning. The only one who would not be affected, I mean, if we would cast a lightning spell there, you know, nor everybody would be dead. <laughs> so, no, I'm changing the weakness to the logical weakness, which is wind. I thought as much. Sukuna Hikuna raised his oar above from the shallow water. You are about to make a grave mistake, he warned. What do you mean? What do you mean? Azahi asked. Maybe now realizing that trusting the so-called son of Lady Danu was a mistake. No doubt Autumn's machination has steered you to these consecrated ground. Also, well, in Shin Megami Tensei, because this is the actual dialogue I changed a bit, but when I say consecrated ground, consecrated means sacred. So if it really is Krishna that was there, then yes. This would be considered a temple. This would be considered a holy tirta or holy place. Meaning, yeah, it is consecrated ground. In our, but in our context, not so much. Shukuna, he, Shukuna he seated. Other among the, ken, kun, the kunitsukami may lap up the All Father's lie, but I know better. Then as she gazed sideways to Krishna. No, no, he's not referring to me. It is Odin who is known as, as the All-Father. The Supreme Lord did the most graceful air quote in existence. But what is more interesting is that this dwarf believe we have been sent by a Norse-inspired god, not by Dagda. Hmm. Nanashi agreed. It was weird. Maybe they worked together. To unseal the Ark is to betray the world, Shukuna Hikona interrupted Nanashi's musing, his eyes flashing with a mystical glow under his cowl. I will put you ignorant fool in the grave before I let you usher in ruin, he roared as he prepared to unleash frozen hell and frost on the frost-sensitive youth. Nanashi simply blasted the dwarf away with the hurricane force wind, as expected, the diminutive god was projected to the other side of the cavernous hall, hitting the far wall with the sickening crack. And that takes and that takes care of that. The Vaishnav Punk dispassionately spoke, rehooking his shovel with a flourish and dusting his head non his hands nonchalantly. Alright, Azahi, the course is clear. You can do your thing right now. Better he did not overthink about what he was about to release. Azahi gave a mock salute and sauntered off to the seal as she put her hand on its rocky surface. Uh, as she put her hand on the rocky surface, a powerful light glowed from within. The whole floor became covered with elderich line and something terrible began stirring. Kripa, before he emerged from the seal, there is something I would like to mention. Go for it, Krish. Not like I can abandon you anyway. It was part of the deal, as long as his sister survived. I am the world's greatest idiot. He belatedly realized that Krishna was by no means obligated to protect Azahi. Nanashi was already his. No. I know bigger fools. Krishna gave Nanashi one his amused smile. 
I just wanted to point out how everything in the opening of the seal was rather convenient. He was right. While the boy with the lion shirt knew he was not the smartest, he also knew that when things were set up conveniently, the two crests kept in the same location, the fake jump and the arc is openable. In hindsight, Nanashi could have probably made a much better prison just by chucking one crest in the middle of a poisonous swamp, or better yet, destroying one crest and hiding the other one in an unreachable place. Have you understood? They wanted the thing out. It was the only reason he could see why it was so easy. This. Somebody was pulling strings. They were but puppets. The orb. What could only be called. In the orb. What could only be called the compressed, liquefied form of deep depression, lust, madness, and nihilism stirred, its vile tentacle reaching out to drag whatever it could wrap itself in the deepest pit of self-loathing, and Azahi was right in front of it. Azahi, move! But the daughter of the boss just stood there, frozen in fear as she realized the calamity she had freed. Oh, Krishna, please do something, he prayed in desperation. Suddenly, the angel burst forth from Azahi's smartphone and, wrapping her arms around the frozen girl, flew away from the oozing darkness. She landed by the supreme personality of Godhead, the shelter of all surrendered soul. In the middle of the room, the storm orb lost its integrity and crumbled like dust, revealing an oozing, squirming, bellowing cloud of of the condensed desire for humanity, of for death, hopelessness for anything better, the realization that this life meant nothing, for it will all end with a final death. Nothing mattered. Life is but waiting to disappear, to fade to black, to end this big lie of existence. The ultimate goal of life is the Krishna, the supreme personality of Godhead, supreme reality, reasserted himself as he wrapped his soft yet mighty arms around Nanashi, grounding the teen back into reality. Kripa, Kripa, whatever you do, do not listen to this impersonalist. Krishna's sweet yet deep voice resonates in Nanashi's heart and ears, in Nanashi's heart, all around him and right behind him. The Lord's cooling and fragrant hand were covering his ears, blocking out the filthy desire of the abomination. The shadow coalesced and seemed to be absorbed by something human in shape. The more it disappeared inside its vessel, the more details Nanashi could make out. A pair of long boots, dark-skinned hand holding a flute, a faded blue tailcoat that was more teal than anything, a fedora, a peacock feather, short, messy blue hair, and his face. Nanashi's vision blurred. I just gazed at the face of the one who haunted his dream every night, who was now start, who has now started to invade his waking hour. Nanashi gazed at someone who should not be there. Suddenly, two somewhat powerful presents made themselves known. One was the world edgiest skeleton, Dagda, and the other was a blue and gold bean carrying a wicked spear and a four-eyed raven. The abomination addressed them, his voice bailing a cold, rootless desire. Odin, doctor, it is you I have to thank for my freedom. He languidly stretched himself, his back popping in a few places. A terrible shiver went up and down Nanashi's spine as he tried to bury deeper in Krishna's reassuring embrace this abomination. It wore a peacock feather and held a flute, just like his lord. He looked like his deceased master, lover, object of protection. But his voice, he sounded human. But there was something in there that wasn't right. Also about the lover part? Well, it should have been brother. Anyway. Dagda gave a smug sneer and at the god, at the Norse god. See, I told you it would work. Odin simply gave an all-suffering look to the bean. 
Nana, she had a hunch this dog that kept posting on the way to the ark. It's been too long, Krishna. Alden inclined his head, addressing the abomination cordially. Nanashi felt his heart stop. The angel turned a startled gaze at the Lord and Krishna. Nanashi's Krishna. He did not speak a single word. The Lord's gaze was devoid of hatred. Only sadness played in them, as his fathomless glance never once left the fraud. The thread of destiny have come and done. The fig gestured grandly, his movement wrong. I decree to all the living entity rotting in this illusion called reality that salvation is at hand. His bold declaration resonated throughout the vast expanse of the, ca of the cavern. <sighs> What's going on? Nanashi, you. This is... It's not Harry. Nanashi sputtered as he gave a hard look at a fake. He could point out around 50 things that showed this Krishna to be a freaking fraud. The face of the fraud was thin, not emaciated, but lacked the beauty and sweetness of his Krishna. Nanashi was sure no symbol decorated his dry, mundane-looking hands. The golden flute he held looked dull and dead compared to Krishna's lively and glowing instrument. The fraud's lips were thin and dry. His Krishna's mind-stealing lips were full, moist and sweet and red. And the Lord's golden eyes held the entire universe in them. While the fraud's eye held not even the spark of life, their eyes blew death held the same fog as of a fog a dead eye would have. Only madness and hatred seemed to make him move. And yet... Nanashi could not banish the reality that this fake Krishna looked disturbingly like him. Okay, so this is a uh, memory. Aegis, can you wake me up in five minutes? It was the 5th of March. It set up for a beautiful day. Yuki had been sick for some time now. His body never reached the morgue. He now stood in front of him. Krishna gestured to Odin, who lowered his head. My lord, this was all of Dagda's plan, Odin admitted with a clenched fist. It sounded painful to acknowledge his dependence on the other god. And it worked without a hitch! Ha! Dagda barked as he punched Odin on the shoulder. And ya thought it would fail, Odin sighed. Oh, What's going on? This... Did he... The girl couldn't... Azahi could not even form a phrase. The close encounter with the eldritch abomination, leaving her completely shaking. This... Please tell me he will help Flynn. He... Kirsha's a good guy, right? She managed to choke out. <laughs> of course he is. The Celtic god is... Wait. <laughs> of course he is. This effectively appeased Azahi's fear. Here, take this for your trouble. He neglectfully handed his sister a respectable lump of maca. Get yourself something nice. You deserve it. Come, Dagda. We must find Flynn as soon as possible. Krishna called the god, very keen to leave the place yet that had that had held him captive for so long. Why? You you will help him, right? Azahi stuttered. Sweat covering her forehead. Her skin had turned gray. Her voice choked with fear. The fraud gazed at the shaking Azahi with his empty eyes and then glided closer to his sister. Halt! Do not come closer, demon! Mai spread her wings, trying to look as intimidating as possible. Nanashi could not move. He could only stare in disbelief. This wasn't his Krishna. But it could it be Yuki, if he was. Believe in me. He was right in front of Azahi. The fake Krishna then put his filthy hand on her cheek as a parody of a gesture of affection. Believe in me, and I shall give you salvation. Thankfully, the angel was quick to cast her most potent Hama spell, blinding everyone in the vicinity and pushing the vessel of madness away from Azahi. 
The fraud merely recoiled, gesturing to Odin and Dagda to stay where they were. It's all right. She is simply not used to my awesome power. He turned back to the angel and traumatized and Nanashi's traumatized sister, giving them what could pass for a winning smile. It's all right, my child. Soon you will be freed from all pain. Oh, Krishna, I know you wanted this dude free, but I've never met anyone so mother-effing creeping in all my life. Kripa, who said it was the abomination I desired to free, Krishna revealed. There is more than what you can see. Like the fact that I, like the fact that I'm Aegis, a robot? That, like the fact that I used to be Aegis, a robot? And that Yuki, my Yuki, Krishna, what the hell's going on? Pranic grabbed his throat. He could feel the entire, his entire world tilt on its axis. I will explain later, Krishna assured, as his eyes never left the fraud. Yes, Krishna agreed, leaving Dagda all but forgotten. But first, Flynn must submit to our cause. Ah, oh, fudge sickle, Krishna cursed under his breath. What do you mean, submitting to our cause? As he asked, still shaken. It was clear his sister was getting an outstanding lesson about trusting those who were clearly evil. The fraud gazed at Zahi, and then moved his dull eyes onto Nanashi and paused for a bit. For a moment, a familiar glimmer of life re-entered his voided pupil, some hope for salvation, and then it was gone. Krishna, let's go. Krishna, let's go. Can't miss our important with our hero. Dagda impatiently called out. The fraud smirked. Yes, indeed. And with that, Krishna's evil copy disappeared in a swirl of shadow. He was followed closely by Odin. By Odin. Dagda lingered behind for a bit, his acid green eyes landing on, on the Zahi and the angel. Kids, Things are about to get real interesting real fast. You may want to wrap up whatever unfinished business you may have. And then he too followed the other in a flurry of clover. Right, so he was the son of Lady Danu. <laughs> With the oppressive power gone, Nanashi could finally breathe and try to grasp the magnitude of what had just happened. This is bad, Nanashi. They played us big time. His sister stuttered. Nanashi, Nanashi felt Krishna's grinding, soothing hands on his aching shoulder. Kripa, do not let your anger get the better of you, the Lord warned. Nanashi unclenched his fist. He could already feel the nail mark healing. Oh, what have we done? I just wanted to make a name for myself, not this. Krishna's little speech about selfish selflessness reemerged from Nanashi's memory. Now, after years of protecting his sister, he could see for who she really was. He had enough. Now, knowing that the time was of the essence, Nanashi turned his heels and ran back to the entrance, praying to God that he would be there on time to try and salvage his situation. And then he paused. His sister had collapsed to her knees, her shoulders shaking as she realized the magnitude of her mistake. Nana, she ran back to his sister and the angel comforting her. Hazahi, get up. You can start your pity party once we get to Flynn. He shook her shoulder, trying to get her out of her mental headspace. If he didn't have this luxury, then neither would his sister. Hazahi, her face pale and blotchy, looked at her brother with some hope in her eyes. You're right. You're right. We can still stop this. She got up from the watery floor, determination once again shining in her eyes. Yeah, Flynn and Isabo should already be in Ginza. Come on, Nanashi. She grabbed her adopted brother's arm and, using it for support, rushed out to try to save the entire whole situation. So I wanted to make Nanashi run out in anger. But at the same time, you know, he's been pract he's been, for someone with a habit, I can tell you, changing a habit takes a long time. And he still loves his sister, but, well, 
he's trusting her less right now. Krishna gazed at the two at the two as he stood beside Mai, who had been forgotten in a frantic scrambling. My lord, the angel addressed the supreme personality of Godhead. Yes, my dear. He gave his favorite Abrahamic angel a loving sidelong glance. My lord, please forgive me for I have sinned. Krishna closed his eyes. He not quite hated but had a massive dislike of empty confession of sins. He already knew what you did, and confess confessing the wrong would not erase it from one's record. Yes, I am aware. What, are, what, are, what was your sin? he asked nonetheless. I have lied, the angel revealed, now kneeling in the water with her, folded, with her palms folded. What did you lie about? My lord, I knew what was hidden under the well. And? Why didn't you stop Azahi? Because, my lord, this is your will, and who am I to try and change your mind? Krishna inclined his head at a self-realized soul stuck in the body of an Abrahamic version of a Vishnu Dutta. You are dear enough to me that I would have taken your suggestion seriously. Indeed, but... Yes? Thank you for giving him a second, chain, a second chance. Krishna mercifully gazed at the angel. She had been w the one who had prayed and fasted for this opportunity. While it was motivated, she had some bhakti in her simple heart. And, and it was not as if Krishna didn't want him to be out. Many desired him to return, and have waited long enough longing past to the Supreme Lord's face, and I do believe you also have to return. To Azahi's smartphone, he spoke with a smirk. The angel puffed her cheek with dejection. She liked being around Krishna and out of the storage, but she knew that things were about to get interesting. Let the game begin, and indeed, so I've been following canon pretty closely, but in a few chapter. Canon is going to get a bit messed up. Okay, so this was the Servant of, uh, of Goranitai. Thank you for listening to me. I'll see you again later.